Welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast, where frontline sales leaders teach you how to build and scale an outbound sales team. Welcome back to the Predictable Revenue Podcast. I'm your co-host, Colin Stewart. Today, I'm joined by my co-host, Aaron Ross. Aaron, welcome. I am a co-host and guest. (laughs) Co-host, guest. Good to be back. Good to have you back, man. Um, wanted to take, we've had a bunch of questions and from a couple of webinars and from a couple, you know, people reaching out to the newsletter, responding to the newsletter, asking us about timelines and budgets and success metrics around building an SDR team. And this just, it felt like one of those ones where, you know, we can bring all the guests in, you know, and we, we get a lot and we try and ask them, you know, sort of these questions in their experience. But of all the people, you've probably seen most teams grow. Um, yep. So I wanted to talk about, why don't we start by talking about how long does it take to build an SDR team? So yeah, when you're thinking about building an outbound program, obviously one of those even, uh, choices you make before building a team is should we outsource something or should we build our team? So it's this, and there's pros and cons to each. Let's assume you, you're decided on building your own team and there's reasons you would over outsourcing, maybe reasons you wouldn't. I will say the one reason it's not a good choice to build your own team yet is if you just don't have the time, the management time and attention to hire someone and actually manage them. Hmm. Even though ultimately building your own team usually is the best long-term solution. So let's say that you do have that, you do want to hire someone. Um, Really a lot of the time, it doesn't really start. There's some preparation you can do, but things really can happen once you get them hired and some basic training. So that often is anywhere from a couple weeks up to six weeks. If you can transfer someone internally, it can be faster. If you have to do a bit of a search, it can be longer, but it's, it's a few weeks to get that first person in who can do this full time. Mm. Well, my point is this whole, the part-time stuff. I mean, you can, there's these different models we talk about where you can, again, you can, outsource, you can build your team, you can do both, and then you can bootstrap. So if you're bootstrapping, it means you're doing something part-time, you have an intern doing it, you have someone who's, again, doing it part-time, you're just not going to get much. You can start there and you can learn a bit, but the magic won't happen until you get someone who's there doing it full-time. And I'm repeating myself because I see this time and again where people don't get someone in there doing it full-time. You get my point. Everything else is a warm-up. So could I, could I have a, another job and then maybe just do this on the side? Is, it, is that what you're saying? Mm, no. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can experiment, but you know, like if sometimes if you don't have the time or money, again, you can be scrappy. You can do a little bit here and there to learn and get the ball rolling, but mm-hmm. you're not going to see a big, much happen until you get someone who can do it full time. I like, I like the way you sort of framed it there is like, if you're doing it part time, it's really just an experiment. It's a, I'm trying to get some proof points to see if this is something that we should invest more time and resources yeah. in. Is that- well, mm, sometimes, but here's another trap people fall into. Whether they're doing it part-time as a test or even if they do outsourcing as a test, like outbound, like any other major initiative, is, it's not going to work unless you decide, we're going to do this. It's going to happen. And whatever I'm, my test is, whether it's part-time or outsourcing, my test is not whether I'm going to do this or not. It's getting started to learn what's working and not so that I can do the next step better because, and then we'll get into timeframes. I mean, it can take, I've seen companies take, uh, and there's so much variety, but let's go a year. It's not uncommon to get their program up and running and, and to be really effective. Mm. Could it be longer? Could be shorter, but you know, the, uh, the testing doesn't work. I say testing doesn't work. I'm going to do this for two months and test it. No. It's like saying, I'm going to do a diet for two months and test it. Oh yeah. If it doesn't work, it doesn't tell you anything. It just means that that diet didn't work. You got to try a different one. So fundamentally there are some reasons why some companies shouldn't do outbound. Like a lot of consumer companies, although you can use outbound and channel development. If you have a really an uncommoditized, uh, a commoditized service, I mean, there's, there's a lot of people who need to nail their niche first before outbound even makes sense. Hmm. But for most companies, they need to do outbound. You need to be prepared to go the distance. And the tests are not whether I should do it or not. It's trying to figure out your way through the, the, the jungle to figure out how to make outbound work for you. You mentioned something earlier. You said, you know, it can take a year for a company to get their team up and running. What, what, how do you define up and running? 
Uh, so yeah, I would not, not the team in place, but at the point where you have a team and they're creating some sort of regular number of qualified opportunities per month, right? Pipeline. And you feel confident that there's, you're going to make money from it. You may not have seen deals close yet because to take an extreme example, if you sell to like the federal government and it's a year long sales cycle, you're not going to see rev. I mean, you're not going to see revenue from outbound until 18 months, 24 months later. So it's, you have this confidence where you can, you've, you're getting a regular number of appointments, they're getting qualified and you see things moving through your pipeline, whether well, there may or may not be revenue yet. So the team might be in place. You might have like the people there after six weeks or two months, but again, sometimes it takes four months to get to the point of, yeah, this is working. We're going to see money. Sometimes mm -hmm. it takes a year. Gotcha. And what are those, when you're, when you're saying, yeah, we're going to get this, we're going to see money. What's the, the sort of first, you know, what's first tipping you off in that direction? If you're, if we've got some first timers that are listening in on this, they're saying, Hey, I'm, I'm in the jungle right now. Um, where, what sort of, what type of light should I be looking for? Like, what are the, the pieces well, that you can help? Yeah. Here's what you don't look for is you've been at it for three months and some executives like, where's the revenue? I mean, if you have a two week sales cycle, maybe, but most people don't have a two week sales cycle for outbound. So one of the mistakes people make is they just have crazy unrealistic expectations on how fast money's going to come in. Right. That's one. Another place people get wrong is they say, Hey, um, they've been, usually they've been successful at inbound, maybe even too successful at inbound. And like we have a 60 day sales cycle. So if we get our team in place in three, you know, two months and if we optimize it all, so four months, and then we should start seeing revenue, you know, around that time. Like now you're in your outbound sales cycle. You have to expect it to be, there's no hard and fast rule, but expect it to be twice as long as your inbound sales cycle. So again, just this, this sense of expectations on, it takes longer than it usually almost always takes longer than people think not only to get the team up and running, to get the people in place, the processes done, but then also to see that things close. And a really common mistake is people just quitting too soon or being too, uh, uh, despond, I don't know, despondent may not be the right term, but, uh, not willing to make the investment they need to at the beginning, uh, and, and not setting it up for success. So what you are looking for stage by stage would be if you think about an outbound funnel or do top down like the book, you know, so you're, you're building a list, you're sending emails, making calls, getting responses, demos, pipeline. So at the very beginning, you're just looking for, are we sending emails? And are we getting responses? Are we getting positive responses? Are we having conversations on the phone? Are we getting appointments? So at each step you are looking for some kind of traction, um, but you're not looking for revenue too fast. You're looking for the appropriate type of, result at the stage you're at and you're just working your way through that funnel from top to bottom so that emails calls appointments meetings pipeline at some point the revenue will happen mm -hmm. and it's just you have to be uh it's it's really rare but it happens faster than people expect you kind of hinted at this earlier but sort of building out what you said sales cycles for outbound um do you see sales cycles being a bit longer a bit shorter with inbound or with inbound or outbound yeah, outbound, you know, the nature of outbound is that you're finding people who may or may not be considering a project. So you're catching them earlier in their decision-making process. Inbound, people are already in some kind of process, right? So they're further along in their consideration and they already know you to some extent. Outbound, they probably don't know you. They're probably not thinking about it. So de by definition, they're going to take longer. Oh, our sales cycles are going to get longer. So this is incremental revenue. Right. So, the, and also you're looking for deal sizes on average that are probably three to 10 times large. So outbound deal sizes should be three to 10 times larger than your average inbound deals. Right. Inbound is great. They're coming to you faster sales cycles, you know, close rates, who knows outbound is great. Longer sales cycles, but bigger deal size and revenue you wouldn't have had otherwise. So the, that's why sale, things like sales cycles and a lot of the metrics can be different in your outbound funnel versus your inbound funnel. And it's not like a short sales cycle isn't better. It doesn't mean anything unless you look at the context of what you're looking at. This mm -hmm. deal, right? 
The, the two things I like is that you sort of, one with outbound is that you get to pick your customers, right? So instead of just waiting for this magical funnel to, for meetings to show up on my calendar, I get to actually say, okay, these are the types of, these are the co- exact companies that I want to target. I'm going to go after them. And, and the second piece, and I know, you know, some salespeople are, you know, are going to disagree with me here. Um, but I kind of like that it gets you in the, in the deal early. Uh, Cause you know that, you know, they, if they're not in a process, they haven't inbounded to all of your competitors yet. You get sort of that chance to, you know, you've got the first crack at it. You get the first chance to shape how they, how they see the pain and you get to dig. It is more work as a salesperson, but I find those are the biggest, best deals that you can, you get a chance to really earn it. Yeah, for sure. And I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of companies that have been too successful at inbound. And, you know, in, inbound is great, but one of the problems, like you mentioned, is that if someone's coming into you, they're probably coming into three to five of your other companies just like you. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, you know, a problem outbound, you have to do more education. So, you know, they go great together, but I think it's an important thing is you're aware of the advantages and disadvantages of each and that you're aware that they're different and they can be measured and tracked differently through much mm-hmm. of the, the process and not try to treat them too similarly. Yeah. I think that's, that's super key. I mean, you, you said it yourself, you know, you've got to, you've got to do a little bit more education with outbound. I, I find, you know, a lot of the AEs that I run into, they'll say, oh, you know, the, the leads from outbound, they just, they just weren't as good. Yeah. They weren't ready to sign like my inbound leads. Exactly. I had to work. I had to actually work with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, it happens a lot. I mean, we, we really, the, uh, in general, the sales culture of today has gotten to be more reactive with all the inbound lead generation. You know, I was just at a company, a, a, a 10,000 person famous company, yesterday and the, the whole culture is based on renewals the whole sales culture is based on renewals it's completely reactive and there's a lot of other issues but partly why they've created an outbound program and it's it's early is they they want to create not only more revenue but to create a way to create more uh, add more proactive a uh, proactive mentality to the sales process right and it's going to take a while because you know, a lot of it's once they not only are working with salespeople, but as they promote their people into sales, it'll start to, you know, help speed up change. But just a lot of companies, uh, there's that phrase, they've been too, six, too successful at inbound, they become dependent on it. Hmm. And they, it's, a, it's a mentality shift and culture shift to do outbound. You mentioned the, uh, where do I want to go with this? Because basically you were, we were talking about qualifying for outbound how that's a little bit different. You got to really work for it. Uh, there was something I, I wanted to ask you there um, that just totally slipped well, my mind here. One more example. Okay. So here's one mistake people make a lot is they put, they, they create one dashboard with a bunch of inbound and outbound metrics lumped together. Mm-hmm. And I have one that has like an executive summary. What I'm talking about is more an operational, um, like the inbound dashboard really should be different. It's separate than the outbound dashboard. Assuming you have inbound leads, not everyone does, because those metrics are different. If you have outbound reps, inbound reps, uh, outbound SDRs, inbound SDRs, like they're calling, they're emailing, all those metrics should be different. Mm-hmm. If you, again, another mistake, a lot of people still have junior, the SDRs who are mixing inbound and outbound, right? It doesn't work. They can't, they just, people just can't juggle those two different rhythms or motions. Or unicorn people can, but you can't build a team out of unicorns. You mm-hmm. can build a process, like a unicorn process, but that process means you have different inbound responders and outbound prospectors, and they're different. So uh, it's another just common mistake people make. Yeah, so, I mean, you can, you you can do it. Wall. For sure, you can do it. You just can't do it well. Just like for the longest time, most account execs, they could prospect, they could close, they could manage accounts. You just can't do all three of them or even all two of them well. No, you can't. You can't. In fact, again, this big company, they, they're, they, had this, they have a big inbound lead response team. They wanted to have them do more outbound. So they figured they were going to make their quotas harder. They forced them to do more outbound. Like that, it's not going to work. It doesn't work because they just, it's a different job. And mm. making the quotas higher, I mean, there'd be a few people that could do it, but not the team. The only way to make the team successful is to, to specialize. You, you know, add some outbound roles. And in this case, they would probably be like a pod system where you'd have an outbound prospector and an inbound lead responder and a salesperson targeting a set of strategic or enterprise accounts. So it's a, you, uh, you know, there are people who could 
play a banjo while blowing a harmonica and patting their, you know, the head, top of their head. But yeah, you can't, it's, it's rare and you can't build a team, a scalable team out that way. That's fair. I, I can hardly play guitar, let alone like if somebody asks me a question, the best I can muster is mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, you, you mentioned the, the pods idea and it just brought, brought me back to the question I was going to ask you. Um, have you ever seen, because inbound and outbound deals can tend to feel so different. Have you ever seen uh, companies taking that level of specialization to their account execs? So you're an inbound account exec, you just ha and then have account execs that just tell them to handle outbound? Um, I haven't seen that. You know, I'm not sure. I'm sure someone's tried it. Um, I think usually what happens is the, the big, a bigger problem is when you have account executives who are mixing renewals and new business. Hmm. Um, I mean, look, by the way, in a, account executives, sometimes they hold on. If you hold on to two or three accounts because you just have that relationship, it's a small part of your month. That's fine. But when you actually have to do a lot of renewals on new business, um, the, when they're a new, if you're a dedicated or a new business salesperson and you have the right kinds of training, you can do, you can receive inbound leads and outbound leads. So I think it's really more of the commitment to say, Hey, we have salespeople. They're going to do new business. They're going to have, they're going to be trained and be skilled up to make sure they can handle inbound and outbound appointments to get set up for them. And it's good for them too, because, you know, it, Salespeople who just get fed inbound leads all day long, they just end up being really reactive. Hmm. And I mean, it's, not, it's not bad, but it means when you have a reactive sales culture, you're just missing out on, uh, on growth opportunities. And when you get to that point where inbound leads plateau, and you're like, oh, now we have to develop an outbound mentality, which you include a program, and you, now you're six to 12 months behind. Or if you have... 3,000 salespeople like this other company, you might be two years behind hmm. or three years. I don't know how long it'll take them. That could be, it's a years long journey to change that kind of like that size of a company kind of culture. Yeah. I, I'm sure we've got some people, you know, we might have some people listening in that are thinking, Oh, you know, my inbound is never going to plateau. What, what, can you, do you have some examples in mind of like companies that have sort of hit that growth plateau? Well, let me, okay. So here are some companies that you may think, of inbound companies that actually also do outbound prospecting. So tell me which ones might surprise you. Um, so obviously Google does outbound. Uh, here's one that surprised me. SurveyMonkey does outbound. Mm -hmm. Did you know Facebook does outbound? So there's, I mean, there's a lot more like, or yeah. HubSpot. <laughs> the, the, the companies that defined inbound, Marketo and HubSpot do outbound. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like if those, at some point, everyone needs to do outbound. It doesn't mean you have to do it now. You're inbound, especially when you get investors or go public uh, and you have to keep the growth up. Inbound will plateau. You just don't know when. So the, if you wait until your leads are already plateauing in order to create new channels, and outbound could be just one of more channels, then you've waited too long. So yeah. there is something to be said when you're so busy handling inbound leads. Yeah, of course you just focus on that. But as soon as you can start investing for the future, whether it's channel partners, outbound prospecting, I mean, there's a lot of ways you can generate leads that are not like inbound. Then you should at least start making those early investments to, so that you don't, uh, you're not caught short later. Mm -hmm. I remember, remember we had Mike Stankus from Acquia on the podcast, must've been about a year ago. He's one of our, I'd say first 20 guests. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we talked about sales management, but on the, on the episode, we sort of diverted to talking about Acquia because they were one of your er, early consulting clients. Yep. And I, I remember, I remember him saying that in the early days when he first heard, heard about the book and he heard about you, he was actually against it. Do you remember that conversation? Yeah. Cause Acquia, I don't know. They, our work with the Drupal community. It's basically like Red Hat for Drupal. It's paid services on top of Drupal. Mm -hmm. And they had a huge, you know, huge inbound volume. And they were getting to t tens of millions of revenue fast through inbound. So like, I don't know, why not? Why do outbound when you're just power rated, growing like crazy through inbound? You barely keep up. Yeah. Do you remember the stat he shared no. about the percentage of revenue? It, it stuck with me because it, I haven't been able to forget it. He said 
you know, at the beginning, inbound was 100% of their revenue, obviously, um, and he was against it. And now, or I mean, now, now is a year ago, um, at least a year ago, he said that over 90% of the revenue comes from outbound. Oh, yeah, wow. Yeah. Changed. Well, uh, in that case, too, and that's, they started doing outbound. I don't remember if they were 40 million, 50 million, 60 million, but they wanted to make sure they could break 100 million in revenue. And the inbound and outbound together helped. Uh, they were named the number one fastest growing software company in North America a few years ago. So it's like, if you want, that's why if you have investors, if you want to maximize how fast you're growing, outbound is one channel of different that you at some point need to have a plan for, whether you're doing it now or in the future. Um, but I have seen a lot of companies. And I remember I talked to a, a board member of a company uh, of New Relic a, few, a couple of years ago. And they're like, why would we do outbound? Like we're you know, basically, we have enough, we're, we're growing fast enough with inbound. Like, well, why wouldn't you do outbound? Really? Yeah. If, if there's a channel that's potentially going to help you grow faster. Yeah. Or partners or, I mean, it's the yeah. time. is now the right time. Maybe not. It was, but it was more the, why would we do outbound? That's, and there's a lot of that today around our, pro, you know, whether early stage companies or later, like we're going to build the best product and people are going to just come to us. We don't want to have to sell, <laughs> which is great if you don't have investors, but at some point, you're going to have to sell, whether it's having professional salespeople and whether it's doing admin prospecting. Um, and because it, it makes you money, it helps find more people who don't have your product who need it. It makes you mm -hmm. money and helps keep your growth up. It especially makes you if less, you, dependent on one, less dependent on one channel. Yeah, especially if you, what you're doing is new and unique and, and the people that are typically buying your product you don't, don't think about, oh, I could, you know, I'll just go on Google and see if I can solve this problem and ask it in the right way that they're going to find you or your inbound resources. Mm -hmm. okay. So I want to pivot the conversation a bit and, and ask you about, we've sort of hinted at it a couple of times, but some rough timelines we talked about, you know, you said 12 months, 24 months to really, you know, 12 months to really get this, the team up and running. Uh, up to, it could be like six, six to 12 is what we tend to, to look at internally. So, so, so what, 12 is if there's some things that go wrong, like, like just give me an example, you, the, the manager you hired didn't work out or there's people issue you have to read and hopefully it doesn't happen often. Or if you have a really tough niche, 12 is more reasonable than six. Hmm. What, so maybe let's break down that 12 first before we jump into the investment side. How, what if that, how long is it, is it going to take me to, if I'm sitting and I'm sitting here at zero, I'm, I'm the CEO of a company that, that said, hey, I want to build an outbound team. I don't have somebody internally that I can get to sort of run the program or be an SDR. What am I looking at time to hire some people here? Well, this, I start with like maybe time to revenue. And so like a really rough calculation I would think is, um, let's call it again, four to six months to get, let's call it four months if it's a software company. Four months to get pipeline generating and then if your average inbound cycle was three months, let's call average outbound cycle would be eight, six months. So four months to get the pipeline going plus average outbound sales cycle of six months equals 10 months to start to see regular revenue coming in. Gotcha. So now could you see something come in fast early? Sure. Um, could, you know, so, but that's just a way to think about how long it's take to get to revenue. Mm -hmm. And, the stages would be, you know, let's call it like a month to get someone in place, whether a transfer or external hire. Uh, ideally, you also need someone internally who can, you can coach them and be sort of like a project manager. Again, this is where there's lots of ways to do it. If you, you could like hire a manager to be the first prospector and they're sort of doing everything until they can hire more. You can hire a prospector and sometimes it's even the CEO manages them part-time until it's further along and they can, so there's a lot of uh, variability there, but it's really the first thing, first major, after making the decision to do this, the first major step is getting that dedicated person on board. It's better if you can get two people on board doing it full time, because it's better when you do something new, it's better to start with two. And you get the buddy system. If one person doesn't work out, and most people, it should not, should not be a high turnover job, but some companies have trouble hiring the right people, especially if they don't get help. So you get a buddy system. You also can test different, you know, if they're getting results or not, is it the person or the process? And it's better to have two dedicated to it. Um, and in fact, I wouldn't say usually we, you don't want more than like three. 
it's so if you're creating a process up front, if you have too many people, they just, there's too many too, people getting in the way. Too so many chefs like, in the kitchen. Yeah. It's sort of like what Acquia did was they had three prospectors and a manager, really more like a, almost a part-time manager. He managed a sales team and doing this too. And for six months, they just nailed the pro. We, you know, we got the process down. And after six months, they then said, Hey, let's expand the team. So you want to start small, you know, ideally two, maybe three, one, if you can, if you can't, and then get the process down and get some uh, data down before you start to expand the team too fast. Cause again, expanding the team too fast, you're going to have shooting yourself on the foot. So slow down at the beginning before you can speed up later. And what about uh, executive sponsorship? Like, do you need to have, is that critical? What if the team or the management team doesn't sort of believe in this? Yeah, well, you for sure need to have, I mean, this is a major initiative for most companies, which is building an outbound program that's going to help drive revenue. So you do need executive coach or sponsor, not only for hiring and budgets, but also to make sure things happen. Like, let's say you need to change your CRM system or you need to purchase new technologies, or you need to reconfigure what you have, or you need to make decisions around territories, markets, responsibilities. So you do need someone at the top who's gonna to be able to make sure decisions get made and things happen. I mentioned budgets. Most of the costs, when you're, when you're spending money to build outbound, like the tools and technologies really are not that much compared to the salaries. So really the, the, the significant investment is when you're hiring people. So if two SDRs, depending on might be fully loaded, you know, hundred to hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the for twelve months. For for both of them. For two full time SDRs, just picking a number. Obviously, in San Francisco, it'd even be more, or in New York, mm -hmm. more. Um, a lot of that just is affected by where you live. If you have a manager who's dedicated to them, that could be another hundred and fifty thousand. Easy. You don't. So some people do. Some people don't. Uh, if you, the tools and technologies, it's really not, it's maybe a few hundred dollars a month per at total. So it's the salaries that really affect the budgets. If you hire someone for training, what like say, whether you hire training or consultants like us, that's another line item. But usually the salaries are the biggest thing to consider. Mm -hmm. So really, it, have, sorry, go ahead. And so that means you have to say, if we may, if we don't expect revenue to come in in a regular way until 10 months out, and we're spending um, X thousands of dollars a month on this. You have, they have that executive has to have that long-term investment mentality. Say, all right, it's been it's been eight months. We haven't made any money with this. We've been we've spent a hundred thousand dollars already, or two hundred thousand dollars already. You know, should we should we shut it down or are we going to keep it going? So they need to say, yeah, let's keep it going because yeah, of course we're not going to make money with it yet. The first year is often a building year, and you should see some revenue. The second year is when you see a lot of revenue. So at Salesforce, the first year we actually saw a million in revenue, which was a lot. How big is your team uh, there? Uh, two people. Okay. All right. So I did it the four, this is when I started at the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And then there's a second person who did it for six months. So we saw about a million the first year. And most of that came in the fourth quarter. So we had like one deal sprint that occurred maybe six months in or seven months in. Mm -hmm. Almost everything was at the end of the year. And then the second year we did 7 million. So we went from 1 million to 7 million because then we could go from like two people. Let's expand the team to 12. And also besides the pipeline created the prior year, I mean, it's just like a, it's a building process. Right? It's one of those things that results seem to compound on top of each other. Yeah. Once you get it working, it's like the flywheel, but that it's that hard part that first nine months, you know, until the revenue is coming in and everyone's like, Oh, okay, this works. It's like people just need to stay the course. Mm -hmm. and, and so we sort of answered the investment question, which is it can be 150 to 300,000 plus tooling plus getting extra help. If, if that's what you, if that's what you need for the first sort of year. Yeah. I say there's like, right? there's like the ideal case. Mm -hmm. So the ideal case is you have two full-time outbound prospectors yep. and you've got a manager who may, it doesn't have to be full-time, but they can, do what they need to do to make sure that their people are getting coached and supported and things like that. So, you know, if you say maybe that manager is half time, they don't have to be full time. Sometimes they are. So 150. So it's, you know, in the range of a 200, 225,000, just call it 250, $250,000 for the year. Be like mm -hmm. the ideal case. 
Um, obviously you can do the minimum is having one dedicated outbound prospector. All right. So call that 75 to 90 fully loaded. It's mm-hmm. kind of the minimum there. Um, add on some tools, some coaching and stuff. Again, all that is it's, this is where like, if you're going to do it, you might as well do it right. right. Salesforce.com is still the best. I've heard there's a couple apps out there. Like one client uses copper. They really like, I haven't seen it yet. Um, outreach and sales loft, those kinds of tools are commonly used. Like you might as well, if you're going to do this, you might as well make the investment to do it. Mm-hmm. So get, get the best person you can. It's better to pay someone a little more, like the better person at the beginning than to try to get someone cheap, who, like a, an intern or someone who just doesn't know, doesn't can think for themselves. Cause I think the, I think the point here is that if you, if you invest in getting the right person, they're going to get you on track. And we're not talking about in the value in terms of salary the greatest value that they're going to provide is in terms of time to results, right? If, right. They, if you can get a, a great person, they'll get you there in nine months. You know, somebody that's new might take twice as long. Yeah. And a lot of this is uh, the more you can hire someone at the beginning who can think for themselves, like, it, you know, entrepreneurial spirit, the easier it is on the managers and executives who don't have to hold their hand all the time. So you'll get better results. Plus it just makes everything easier. So I will say that too, if you're in a tough niche, so you are a creative agency, you're uh, a software development shop. Those are some of the harder ones. You do perfect like custom professional services. You are in the telco like VAR uh, space. And if you haven't you call it, nailed your niche yet, the thing, the main difference, difference that would help you get results from outbound if you decide to do it is having a great prospector because those are, those are tough markets. Some people can make it work. Um, again, there's this get a nail a niche and like have a specialty. Mm-hmm. But the person you hire is probably the biggest difference other than that, that to ensure that you have something that's going to work. Because mm-hmm. you can't, you just can't have people following a process. They really need it at that point. Like in software, you can have people just follow a process. They don't have to be that intelligent even really. I mean, they should be. But when you have a tough market, you need someone who can really think for themselves and be intelligent about it. Mm-hmm. Cause there's, there's just that much more selling that's happening when you're and targeting you're, and mm-hmm. positioning and messaging and navigating you know, all everything. Yeah. If you're a you know marketing agency and your, your differentiator is we have better people or if you're any sort of agency and it's, we have better people, better customer service. Like yeah. we have 10 years experience. It's like yeah. no one cares. And anybody can say that I could start up a an dev agency tomorrow and I could say all of those things you know, it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have an impact on the quality of the work, you know, but anybody can say those things. And so you have to figure out how do I, how do I make this an interesting and relevant angle to approach the market with? How do I find that sort of that niche that yeah. you're talking about? Yeah. What was that company, the web, the web shop, the monkey that we oh, had? Cheeky, Cheeky monkey. Cheeky monkey. Right. So we had this yeah. customer and I was, I was shocked. I didn't think that we would, that they would have be successful with outbound, but they were. Um, I don't remember what their, I mean, you work with them, didn't you call them? Yeah. Yeah. I remember the, I remember those guys. Um, they were awesome to work with just a fun, fun group, fun culture. Website they, building. So they were also like Acquia, they were a Drupal, um, Drupal, Drupal consultancy, um, coming into it, probably a few coming into outbound, you know, obviously a few, quite a few years after sort of Acquia had been all over the market. Um, and what their unique angle was, they only worked with nonprofits. And so yeah, when they okay. sat down, when they sat down with the nonprofit, their whole website was geared, their brand, the cheeky monkey was geared to that sort of fun, not quite so serious, you know, mentality that is commonly found in, uh, in nonprofits. And this is what they told me. Um, so their brand was, was optimized around that. Their site was optimized, their messaging, their case studies, every conversation you had, you felt like you were talking with somebody from the nonprofit space and they just killed it. They were yeah. doing great. So again, professional services company, web design, but they, they nailed their niche. So that's the example of when you're in those tough markets where everyone sounds the same and there's a million competitors like that. So with some, it could be product market, some specialty where you just can really make it obvious to people the value you can bring and what mm-hmm. you can do for them. Yeah, it, different. If you're the very first person into the market, you know, you, you'll have to do a bit more education, but everything's sort of wide open for you. But if you're the second, third, tenth, hundredth, thousandth, 
you need to find these unique angles because, you know, if you're saying, oh, we're the best at this, you know, we're, we have the best customer service, we have the best people, blah, 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 blah. Everybody's heard that before. Yeah. It right? doesn't so, mean anything like, yeah. okay, what is, I don't, how has that helped me? Yeah. How are you different from the last 30 people that have emailed me telling me the exact same thing? And I, I think that's the thing you need to be, uh, people need to be a little bit aware of when you're coming into something like this. So I will say um, the last uh, sort of like new point is that when you're building a program, if you're not the, the CEO, right? So you're a director, a VP, a manager, um, especially at a big company, but because any company, ultimately the success of the outbound program, it really depends on your ability to prove that what your claim is incremental revenue is incremental revenue. So in other words, especially with inbound lead response and outbound prospecting, there's a lot of gray areas and subjectivity. And it's easy for a prospector to claim, like grab an inbound lead and you know, claim it, turn into something and claim it was outbound. What you don't wanna do is, okay, after two years and you've generated 10 million in revenue, well, let's go back to Salesforce actually. So year two, we did 7 million uh, sourced from outbound. And every few months, Mark Benioff would email me, hey, Aaron, I, you know, and every month we would circulate, they would circulate, here's the top 10 deals that closed this month. And I would highlight, here's, you know, the ones that came from outbound, because usually about half of those top 10 deals would come from outbound. And I'd send it back out. Um, and Mark sometimes would ask, well, Penske closed. And there's a partner claiming that they sourced this deal. And you're claiming the outbound sourced it. So like who, who sourced it? So there's ultimately there's this trust and credibility question at the executive level, board level, which is if they can't trust that this is real, at some point it's not gonna, it's gonna stunt itself. It's just gonna mm -hmm. stumble. And every time Benioff asked me about to justify this deal, whatever that was, I could go back because we were so paranoid and diligent about auditing everything from once someone claimed credit for an opportunity, like I checked everyone, we had this whole system to ensure that no matter uh, if, if someone ever questioned it, that we could undeniably claim credit for it without mm -hmm. question. So whenever he asked, we could always say like, here's, a, here's why we do our credit. And after a couple of years, you know, he, he, his skepticism, he lost his, he believed in it. Mm -hmm. um, if you didn't know, Benioff was a skeptic of the whole outbound program because at Oracle, he saw the inside, the same people just in a pa pushing paper for the field sales. They didn't actually add incremental revenue. They would just became assistance for field sales. So at Salesforce, like this all has to be incremental revenue or else it's not going to work. So that's really the ultimate test. Once you have the program up and running and you are generating pipeline and you're seeing revenue to be able to prove without a shadow of a doubt that, you know, what you're claiming is outbound is outbound. It's, it's in, not inbound and you just can trust the metrics. And if you can't trust the metrics, then the executives don't know what to invest in. I'm getting X from inbound, Y from partners, Z from outbound. If I can't trust these, how do I know what to do? Mm -hmm. so that ultimately is the, the number one long-term important principle, the integrity of the, the accuracy of the results you're claiming. Because hmm. you, actually, you've actually seen the case where you've outbound it to a company and then they might not respond, but then they'll come inbound to you? Yeah, well, there's a lot of gray areas. So a lot of happens where I'm, your prospector is emailing some company and they don't want to, they don't respond to you, to that prospector. They go to the website and log it and register as a lead. So that's the case where your outbound isn't getting credit where it should, because those should go to the outbound prospector. The flip side is, um, you know, prospectors usually have permission to go after old cold leads. Mm -hmm. So six months old or uh, what if, um, this is gray area. So if, uh, again, a lead comes in, or here's a better example. I'm a prospector, I'm emailing a company and a lead comes in right, the same day. And we talk to that lead. You don't really know, did the lead come from the prospector's efforts or random until you talk to them. But let's say if you ask the lead, hey, where'd you find out about us? And the lead says, oh, my friend Bob told me to check you out. Then that's not an outbound lead. But so there's these rules of engagement around how to keep inbound and outbound separate that are, can be complicated and there's like gray areas, but what you need is, you know, a very specific audit process and um, understanding that everyone needs to be 
completely on board around only claim credit for outbound when it's deserved and you can really back it up. So that if the CEO asks you, hey, pr prove it to me that you can confidently do it. Mm -hmm. I, I, we've seen that, you know, internally here when we're trying to attribute, you know, which, who gets credit for it? Is it marketing? Is it sales? Is mm -hmm. it the disaster conference that we went to? I, I think one of the, the deals we closed last month we were sort of, we were looking at that. And if we didn't have our data, you know, we, we would have said, oh, it was, it was actually, what was, I can't remember what the last touch was. I believe the last touch was outbound. But when you looked at it, you know, there was the summer sales promotion. There was the Saster. Um, I think Saster was the first touch. Maybe we even talked to them before Saster. And so there was three or four different entities within the organization that all sort of led to sort of warming up this contact. But at the end of the day, it was, it was an outbound campaign that pushed them over the edge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's, you know, attribution is, can be a pain in the butt. I mean, this is a place where you really have to have those rules of engagement and definitions so that you can have confidence that when you're presenting numbers to the executive team or board that outbound did X is right and inbound did Y is right and channel partners did Z is correct. Mm -hmm. So do you subscribe to more of a, like, are you more of a last touch attribution or multi-touch attribution yeah. kind of person? You know, the thing is with outbound, it's usually, there's usually not a lot of multi-touch with outbound. The multi-touch thing is really more with inbound in terms of different campaigns because it's pretty rare with outbound that there is some kind of debate. Um, but in that case, ultimately, in a complex situation, you ask the prospect, hey, how'd you hear about us? And you try to paint a picture and, and if it does happen, for example, like there'll be some marketing, like a director of marketing goes to an event and you talk to them there. And then you talk to the uh, VP of sales and sales. But then a board member read, independently reads predictable revenue. And it's like, we're doing this. And so the other touches didn't do anything really. Mm -hmm. It was the, the board member that, or the outbound email to the board member that like made it happen. And that actually is an example where sometimes lower level people might be reading things and you go outbound to the top and the, to the decision maker. And that's really what the other stuff was just incidental or it could be reversed, of course. But uh, you're trying to, you know, at some point you just have to pick something. You can't get it perfect. You're trying to find out like what really, uh, and if you can do it, like what really set this in motion. Mm -hmm. Um, before we get too deep on attribution, because it's like you said, it's a great area. We could probably spend an hour talking about attribution on its own. I, sort of one last question, just to wrap things up. What are some? You know, we've talked about a couple common mistakes. You know, what's one last common mistake that uh, that you see companies make when it comes to you know either building their first outbound team or sort of scaling up from that minimum viable team? So, a common one is at the beginning being too impatient. Uh, hiring too fast the wrong person or once they're working being too impatient for results. So especially if it's in a tricky niche in some way, uh, so it might be two months and they're not getting the results and you know, it can take, you know, I've seen it take months to get the, you know, response system, the emails down and the calls down and it can, it doesn't have to, but it, it, it can. So I think mm -hmm. impatience is probably at the beginning because they're spending money, like we're spending money, whereas our, Where's our return? Mm. It's just, it's just too fast. If it happens in a few months, great, but you have to expect it's going to take longer than you think. So I think impatience is number one under committing. Oh, we're going to da basically dabble. We're going to have an intern do this for a month and see how it goes. That's not going to do anything. So if you're going to do it, do it and do it right. So those are probably the two most common. Perfect. Aaron, this is super valuable. I want to thank you for coming on the show and we'll definitely get you back on here soon. This has been fun. Yeah, thanks, Paul. All right, man.